Finally, he tired of her foolishness and divorced her and married a woman who was the opposite. She was a good housekeeper, but allowed him to relax and be comfortable. In comparing the two women, he said, the change in wives was like taking off a pair of tight shoes and putting on a pair of soft, comfortable slippers. Hey everybody, it's Vinti Mark and I am back with another video, but before we get started, I would like to invite you to check out today's outfit of the day. And if you have not had an opportunity, head over to themodestfitting.com and sign up for my newsletter so you can be notified when I drop my first collection of skirts and dresses featuring modesty, femininity, and beauty. But without further ado, let's begin. I am continuing a series on a book called Fascinating Womanhood written by Helen Angelin and today we are going over homemaking basics. The way that she words it is fundamentals of a good homemaker. She says the difference between a good homemaker and a poor one is a matter of following correct principles. Here are the fundamentals which lead to a clean, uncluttered, well-organized household. Number one, concentration. The management of a household requires concentration. You can't daydream, ponder problems, and at the same time work with efficiency. Work such as ironing, cleaning, windows, and doing dishes can be done while daydreaming, but most work requires thought as well as hands, especially organizing and meal preparation. Put other things out of your mind and concentrate on the jobs at hand. What is considered lack of homemaking ability is usually mental laziness. I thought that this was a really good point. Um, I think that when it comes to concentration in 2022, the biggest thing that hinders our ability to concentrate is social media. Um, I think back in the day, it may have been the soap operas. Uh, women would have spent hours upon hours watching foolish um, soap operas and spending the vast majority of their time doing that. I think that for today's um, housewife and homemaker, the thing that we can just spend hours upon hours doing is scrolling through social media, spending time on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, Twitter. It just, you can just mindlessly spend your day and really your life um, wasted on social media, constantly consuming content that may or may not be of much value. And so I think that, that I, I think I mentioned it in a previous video, something that I've had to do is I've actually had to go onto my computer and block social media apps such that I actually can't access them during the day. Only I, I've given myself a, a specified time window um, and I made it available to myself after my kids go to sleep because I have found that it really is a time suck and it takes away my efficiency as a homemaker. Number two, simplify. You cannot become a good housekeeper if you have too many things, such as too much furniture, too many dishes, unnecessary clothes, old papers, magazines, too many toys, objects, ornaments, etc. They are of value only if they are useful or add beauty to the home. This is one that I think um, a lot of people um, might necessarily, they might find it challenging. I am someone who hates clutter. Like I declutter maybe even to a fault because I've had to repurchase things that I've previously owned because I got rid of them so quickly. Um, but at the same time, it is true that when you have too many things, it does make life unnecessarily difficult. So when she says that you should keep things only if they are useful or they are beautiful, that is totally true. Something that my husband and I did when we moved into our new house is we um, realized it and our, our first home, um, first home that we own, we realized that the previous owners actually spent quite a bit of time building out the closet space such that there's a lot of intricate shelving um, and storage available for hanging clothes, for you know, placing boxes, things like that. So much so that we just made the judgment call that our kids' room and even our own room, we don't have any furniture. All we have is the beds in the girls' room and then bed here for us and this sofa, this chair, personal chair that I'm sitting on, but outside of that, we don't have any other furniture. I've had some people comment on my videos and say, I love your minimalistic style. And I just was like, I mean, I guess it's minimalistic um, 
But for me, it's just, I don't have any use for that. The closets house all of the clothes and things that we would normally use for furniture. So um, what she's saying, simplify in today's term, we would say, think minimally, think like a minimalist. Only have the things that you absolutely need. And that includes excessive furniture that serves no purpose. Um, so keep the stuff that you need and keep the things that add beauty. But if it's not doing either one of those two things, gather it together and donate it. Get it out of your space. I do this a lot with my children's toys. We have a toy chest and I told them that they can fill it up with as many toys as they want. But once it gets to the point that they can't close their toy chest, then they have the responsibility to go through and look at the toys that they no longer use and we donate that. And that's something that I do probably every other month because unfortunately their, their toy chest is always filling to the brim, just gifts from extended family and things like that. But I don't allow them to, to clutter up even their own space. And I don't allow our house to get cluttered up. We have only the things that we need and the things that serve a purpose. If you have a cluttered household and want to turn it into an organized one, the first step is to get rid of things you don't need. Keep only the things that are essential and discard the rest in boxes. In simplifying a household, everything should be either useful or beautiful. Have only enough useful and beautiful goods to serve your needs. In other words, an egg beater is useful and drinking glasses are useful, but you don't need two egg beaters and 40 glasses. Better to have too few than too many. This is a good point. Um, I think that especially um, with homemakers and sometimes not even homemakers, just um, I, I've noticed that a lot of people, the place that can get very cluttered is the kitchen. Um, I am super anti-clutter even in my kitchen. I, I hesitate to buy new kitchen appliances because the thing I hate the most is having a kitchen appliance that takes up space in my cabinets or on my counters that I am not using, that I constantly have to clean around because now it's in the way. I'm not saying that you have to get rid of everything in your kitchen, but if if the things in your kitchen are not being used, you need to consider letting them go. Even if the things that you have only get used once, twice, or three times a year, they're still getting used. If you have something that hasn't been used in the past 12 months, that might be something that you need to consider getting rid of because it's just taking up space and it's actually making your work as a homemaker for keeping the house decluttered and tidy unnecessarily difficult. Go through your kitchen, go through your kids' toys, go through your own belongings. Anything that hasn't been used in the last 12 months is probably something that you don't need. And if it's stored away in a closet, in a box, or in a cabinet, it's not adding beauty to your home. So two reasons you can let it go. Organ Number four, organize work and commitments. First, list work and commitments you do routinely. Meals, laundry, making the beds, tidying the house, vacuuming, grocery shopping, taking a child to lessons, mending, shopping, weekly cleaning. Then arrange them on a schedule so that you have a specific time to do everything. Next, list the things that you do occasionally, such as appointments, etc. To be well organized in getting your work done and keeping your commitments, use a calendar notebook. Um, I mentioned this in my video where I covered the attribute of self-control, where um, I what I did for myself and what I recommend for uh, women is, I would say if you wake up on any given day and have no idea what your tasks for the day are, you, you're not following this principle of organizing your work and commitments. It is going to make homemaking a crazy making experience if you do not have order structure and discipline about the work that you're going to do so um I, this is a be a recap if you watch that self-control video but for those who didn't i literally walked into my house and i took inventory of all the housekeeping and chores that would need to be done to keep this house in order if you don't know where to start with that i what i did is i went online and i looked up what is what do professional housekeepers do? I looked up a house cleaning list that professional housekeepers do and I pulled everything that I was like, this is what I wanna keep. I discarded the things I didn't and then I went around my house and said, and this also needs to be on that list. So I had a master schedule and I sat down and I scheduled out the things that get done daily. Dishes get done daily. Dinner gets done daily. Making the beds gets done daily. I have um, my daughter who's still young enough that I have to bathe her, so that's on my list of daily chores. Anything that gets done daily, set it as a recurring task on your Google Calendar or whatever calendar you like to use. I like to use Google because it allows me to use my phone. Set it as a recurring um, task 
tasks so that you know the things that you must do. Then there are things that may not get done daily, but they still need to be done routinely. You may need to mop your, the tile in your house once a week. You may need to vacuum the carpets in your house once a week or two times a week or however often you need to do that. You may need to do a deep clean of the windows every three months. Sit down on it in your calendar, open it up and schedule it out. Space out the work so that you're not bombarded on don't load everything up on Monday. Spread it out throughout the week. Spread it out throughout the month. Those things that recur every three months. Make sure that the three month things like washing the windows and cleaning the garage are not all stacked on the same day. Spread that out and, and look at it as a month calendar view. So you can see what your what the feel and the rhythm of what your month is gonna look like and, and don't um, overload any particular day or any particular week. Space it out so that it's actually accomplishable. But what I'm telling you is you will need, it took me probably two days to sit down and really complete a, a master housekeeping schedule, but it is well worth the effort because once you have it in place, all you gotta do is open your phone and look at the tasks and knock them out. And then when you've finished it, then you have time to sit and read. You have time to sit and scroll social media once your work is done. But you've got to come up with a master, a master plan, a master schedule that you use to dictate how you're going to strat strategically use your time for that day such that at the end of the month or even at the end of the week, the house is always in a state of general cleanliness and tidiness and not because you said, oh, it's, I guess it's Friday, so now I gotta sit and do a deep clean. No, you've been doing the cleaning incrementally throughout the week such that at the end of the week, the house is clean. Number five, organize your priorities. Work out wise priorities. Put first things first. To arrange priorities, list your six most important duties, then arrange them in order of importance. Consult your husband and children for their opinions. She provided an example priority list, and her um, example is my appearance regular meals on time, a tidy house, the laundry, so washing and ironing, imperative shopping, and auxiliary things. I thought that it was really important and a good call out that she listed her appearance as something that is on her priority list. And it's actually number one on her priority list priority list. I've had some people give me some pushback on some of the videos I've done about a woman um, needing to take responsibility and pride in her appearance. Um, I've even had someone go as far to say that it is unchristian to place so much um, importance on the appearance. But honestly, I, I, I want to push back against that. When you have a job that you have to report to, you don't go unbathed and without your teeth brushed and with dirty clothes and disheveled hair. Why is it that an employer who pays you but maybe doesn't really care about you gets that kind of attentiveness from you, but your own family doesn't? I think that that shows inappropriate levels of priority. If, a, if your male boss gets to see you bathed dressed appropriately and like you care, why does your husband not get that? That doesn't make any sense. Why is it that your husband and your children get the disheveled you who just rolled out of bed and that's Christian, but to go to work and to bathe and perfume and get dressed and do your hair and put on light makeup if that's what you do, that's being a responsible adult, please. You can miss me with that. Responsibility, every woman, especially a married woman, and even a, a woman who is married and a mother of children, has a responsibility to get up, take care of your personal grooming, take care of your personal appearance and your wardrobe, and present your best to your husband and your children. One, for your husband's benefit and for your children's example. And then even still, even still, it does something for you and your sense of self-confidence and worth to just go through the motions of taking a bath, combing your hair, brushing your teeth, putting on some nice clothes. You will feel better, I promise you. You will feel better if you take care of yourself. Your personal appearance should be on your priority list along with having meals that are healthy and hot on time for your family, keeping your house tidy. I promise you, you will feel better. I, I, some of the most um, enjoyable parts of my day is when all of my work is done and I just get to sit in this chair 
read, look out my window, watch the birds, visit my backyard for the bird feeders. And I look around and my, my bed is made, my house is tidy, the, the table has been wiped down, the crumbs have been swept from under the, the, the table, the toys are all put away. Like I feel good in an environment that is neat and tidy. That should be on your priority list. If you feel like you're in a slump, it's probably because your environment is in a slump. Get your environment together and you'll probably feel your emotional um, state of well-being improve as well. Number six, work. Although you concentrate, simplify, organize, and have priorities well in mind, you will not reach success unless you are willing to work. Good homemaking requires diligent effort, as does any worthy achievement. The only way to run a household is to put on your apron, roll up your sleeves, and go to work. Um, I think that um, sometimes, even with videos like mine, and some beautiful videos I see from other housewives and homemakers, we can get caught up in the aesthetic of homemaking and forget that there's actually work of homemaking. Like in order to achieve that home that is comfortable to sit and relax and have tea and read a book and enjoy the silence, that takes work to achieve that. You won't get there unless you actually get to finally doing those dishes. You won't get there unless you actually put the, uh, that load of laundry back in, fold them and put them back in the drawers. It takes work. So don't, so don't, um, don't be, don't be fooled. Like it, it is a beautiful life and it is a beautiful existence. But there's work that's done to achieve that. And you gotta just get your mind right to accept that I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to use some elbow grease here. Um, number seven, and I think that this is a really important one um, and it's one that can get overlooked. And I think, yeah, let me just read it and then I'll add my commentary. Number seven, make him comfortable. With all of your diligence and homemaking, allow your husband to be comfortable. Remember, his home is his castle. Let him hang his coat on the chair, lie on his bed without concern for the spread, stack his papers on his desk, put his glasses on the dresser, and his shoes by the bed. This doesn't mean that you invite him to be slovenly to the point of imposing on you, but let him be relaxed and comfortable in his own home. This too is part of being a domestic goddess. Children should not be given the same relaxing privileges as their father. They should bend to your training and instructions. I think that this is important and it's one that I certainly was guilty of and I've had to, I've had to ease up, I've had to relax. Um, she mentioned in this book at some point that always like while you are to be the diligent keeper of the home and the one who keeps the home clean and tidy in an inviting environment don't ever forget that the home is for the family the family is not for the home and chief among those people is your husband the head of the household the one who provides for the household who sustains the household you don't run behind him uh, nagging him about where he left his shoes or where he's left his socks. Like, okay, to some, you can, if, if it's really becoming a problem in a sweet and respectful way, you can say, hey, honey, baby, can you, can you leave your shoes here? I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep the, the house, the floors clean. So if you could leave your shoes by the front door, that would be most appreciated. But after you've said it once or twice, leave that man alone. While your children are to be under your authority and submitting to the rules of your house, your husband is in a different class. Your husband is in a different class. So if he comes in and he drops his briefcase and his jacket and his shoes, leave him be, okay? It's not worth the conflict. It's not worth the irritation that you're going to cause him. And in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter where that man left his coat? No, it doesn't. And as much as I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to me. I have to think about, my husband sometimes gets on my nerves about where he leaves his socks. But in the grand scheme of things, when we're old and gray, is it really gonna really matter that my husband left his socks next to the bed? No, like it doesn't matter. It's not gonna affect my health, my mental well-being, my financial standing, the emotional well-being of my children. The socks don't matter that much. Let it go. 
Your husband is in a class by himself when it comes to being the king of his castle. Give him some room, give him some space, get off his back. The home is to be for, it's to be a place of comfortability first and foremost for your husband. Before it is for the children, it's really for your husband. He's the one who's sustaining the household. Um, now I'm gonna read another um, portion that she put in here. Now I've said a couple of times, I, I've prefaced these videos with, hey guys, if you get this book, understand that I don't agree with everything in here. And I've had a couple of people ask me like, what are some of the things that you don't agree with? I'm gonna read an excerpt um, that I had originally omitted on purpose, but I'm gonna include it because I think that it's it drives the point home further, but it does it in a way that I don't like. I don't like um, this notion of mobilizing women to do the things that are expedient for them by using fear. I don't like fear mongering tactics. And something that I've noticed in um, this book is that there is a common thread of do this or else. And I don't like that. I'm like, we can talk about the realities of things that can happen in marriages without saying, if you don't do this and this is gonna happen, I don't like that, but it still drives the point home, so I'm gonna read it. So this is after she's saying like, essentially let your husband be, get off his back. For example, a man was married to a fussy perfectionist housekeeper. She followed him around, picking up after him, straightening the pillows, smoothing the rugs, picking lint from the carpet, and removing his clutter. Finally, he tired of her foolishness and divorced her, and married a woman who was the opposite. She was a good housekeeper, but allowed him to relax and be comfortable. In comparing the two women, he said, the change in wives was like taking off a pair of tight shoes and putting on a pair of soft, comfortable slippers. It drives the point home about how you want your husband to feel at ease and comfortable. I don't like the fact that she kind of, it's, a, it's almost like a veiled threat. Like if you don't do this, he'll find another woman who will, and even in a way kind of um, justifies that kind of behavior in men. That's sin, by the way. Okay, so that's, so that's an example of some of the parts of the book that I don't like, and yet she still is driving the point home about how you're not to be a nag to your husband about how the, the condition of the home. The home is for your husband. The husband is not for the home. But anyway, that concludes uh, seven basics of homemaking. This is certainly not a comprehensive list, but it's a good place to start if you're new to homemaking. And it's also a good review if you've been homemaking for a while, but you have kind of lost sight of just kind of like the principles of how to navigate the world of homemaking and being a housewife, this is a good one. If there's anything that wasn't mentioned, but you think is an honorable mention and should be included on the list, please drop that in the comment section below. As always, thank you for tuning in and I will see you next time.